First Andrew, what was that all about? <laughs> well, um, it's come to my attention that Dr. Green turned a year older over the weekend, and I thought that we should mark the occasion and celebrate his wonderfulness. So I would appreciate if all of you would, on Zoom land, if you are like can show your face, that would be awesome, at least unmute and let's join me in song. Okay. And as Lawrence Welk would say, and a one and a two and a three, <laughs> happy <laughs> birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday Dr. Green. Happy birthday, birthday to you. We love you, Dr. Green. And many more. Somebody needs a change of batteries. That was the slowest happy birthday I've ever heard. <laughs> That's me, Dr. Green. I, I want to suggest that our appreciation is better than singing. Yes. Well, I, I, I greatly appreciate the kind words. Uh, I turned uh, 37 over the weekend. Um, so, which I think oh, in funny. South Carolina years is like 60. <laughs> yeah. uh, You're a no, puppy. I, 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 I thank you all for the kind wishes. Uh, I, I thought this time I had finally escaped. <laughs> Singing them happy birthday. You lulled me into a false sense of security. <laughs> and you got me at the beginning of class. So I, I will give you credit this time. <laughs> well, I'm going to blow out this candle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Burn down the place. One, two, three. Yeah. <laughs> Um, on that cheerful note, uh, let's go ahead and get tonight's uh, session of the Modesto Simpkins School of Human Rights started. Um, of course, most of this semester has been about the people's history of South Carolina, telling a grassroots story of the Palmetto State. But tonight, we're going to take a step back from the history and talk a bit more about theory and thinking about how all of this fits into our current day understanding of how politics, how democracy, how governance actually works. I can assure you it's a much more lively conversation than what I just described. And that's because the two gentlemen we have uh, lecturing for us this evening, of course, um, our first lecturer is Brett Versi. He's gonna provide a bit about the background on democratic theory and practice that's really important and integral to thinking about the current mission of the Progressive Network and then we also have Lewis Pitts, um, who has been a stalwart champion for freedom and democracy and human rights for much of his life. Uh, he is a native of North Carolina. He is a graduate of USC School of Law. Uh, and for many years, uh, through both within and outside legal profession, uh, Mr. Pitts has been heavily involved in fighting, fighting for truth and democracy in every form you can think of. Uh, he will be talking a bit this evening about the role of corporations and how we think about mm -hmm. democracy and governance in the here and now. And, and Mr. Pitts has had a lot of experience on the ground in fighting for human rights. Of course, uh, he was part of the legal team that was involved with the aftermath of the Greensboro Massacre in 1979. Um, he was also the founder of the Program on Corporations, Law, and Democracy, which played a pivotal role in explaining what democracy does look like in America, quote unquote, democracy versus what it should look like. Uh, so I'm going to, without further ado, introduce Mr. Bercy first, uh, without any singing on my part. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I do firstly want to correct that Louis Pitts. Is from Bethune, South Carolina. Right. I've been to his home. Okay. He was born and raised there before there was a stoplight. <laughs> and he did go to the University of South Carolina Law School, where he uh, learned the barrister of which he practiced when I first met him, uh, serving four people in Allendale, South Carolina. And um, he uh, was impressed to duty because in his backyard there was a bomb plant. Oh. And Lewis became our attorney for the National Guard, which we'll talk about 
next class. Mm -hmm. And there's an old saying about how you can trust your lawyer, but he won't go to jail for you. Lewis has been to jail with me. <laughs> and so I trust Lewis. And there have been instances over the last 30 or 40 years when I was in pretty serious trouble. <laughs> and I'd call Lewis and Lewis would come. And so I'm, I'm really deeply gratified to continue working with him now that he has burnt his sheepskin and is no longer a lawyer. Uh, that's something we'll let Lewis talk about. We did put something in your reading material for that. Yeah. I, I do want to say that this is a class today that's my second favorite class of the 16 classes we now have. It's my second favorite class because the next year is my favorite class. <laughs> this class, we talk about our subjective analysis of the ostensibly, um, op, uh, what's the word that's not subjective? The, it's right objective. 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 Today he went to law school. <laughs> but the objective reality is in, it's in the eye of the beholder. And that, um, in fact, I consider us to be the true originalists. But uh, the history that we teach of the people of South Carolina is as true and straightforward as we can make it. And we're swimming against such historic and long told lies, it's difficult to um, not seem to be a bit subjective. But we try and make that presentation uh, a, a transparent analysis of that history that we just spent the last 14 classes of family. And so the next class, uh, after we talk about today about the theory, the analysis and the theory, we analyze what's happening and we, we analyze the theories behind why it's happening and who, who, and then we will discuss who that benefits. But the next class is, what do we do about it? How do you actually practice what you've learned now that you know that we don't have a democracy? And now that you know where the power lies, and now that you've got some insight into what kind of power we need, need to build and how we go about doing that. And so class 15 is about that. And so the next slide will show us this. This is the one that's on the screen, Dr. Green, is that how politics determine how society put human values to work. Think about that, how politics determine how society puts human values to work. And that helps you understand the really important difference between a government and the governance. Do we have a government? And actually, these guys that wrote the government, we'll get into that a little later, that's a pretty good document. They didn't reach their own aspirations, their own values. They were misogynistic, slave-owning, white supremacists, <laughs> but they, they had some good ideas. And so the document itself, the government structure, seems to be sound at least Nobody else is defending it. We can take the high ground in many respects about the true democracy and true representation and um, the, the politics or the delivery system of values. This old guy named Joe Biden said, show me your budget and I'll show you your values. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And I think we've talked enough about where most of the money goes. But what values were reflected in today's politics? In human values, social values, and religious values. The next slide gets us into question one, political theory. And that is, my goodness, political theory number one is about money and power. And that the next slide talks about, and these, slide, these slides will be available on the, uh, on the, uh, on the website. Okay. And the, I'm not trying to hear. One of the things that I've been good at doing and successful at doing and very revelatory at finding out the answer to is simply following the money. You pick up a thread of a decision and you follow it back and you find out what money drove it. I'll use kind of the latest example of that. I've got many examples. I'll just use the latest one. That when COVID came to town, I followed the money that drove McMaster's budget. And he actually had what he called it a COVID budget. He actually called it Accelerate SC. He actually contracted with the South Carolina Hospitality Association to draw the Accelerate SC plan, which is that's when, for the first time, that service workers became essential. Still, still paid minimum wage, but essential. And that the money that came in from that, from the hospitality industry, is something that you can track. And Henry got money 
the main committees that moved it to the moved the budget to the floor got money, and it's, it was a repeat of one. This was in what was that twenty twenty, but it was a repeat of a fight that we had against the same forces, and uh, starting in in, two, in the early two thousands, and then in twenty twelve, and it was about preventing. It's called preventative legislation. When you prevent something that's not happening, most people don't have the power to prevent to prevent bad things from happening. Yeah. These people are going to prevent good things from happening, and it's the NRA, not mm -hmm. the National Rifle Association. The other NRA, the National Restaurant Association, which is the main mm -hmm. collection source for all the money for all mm -hmm. of the chain stores that feeds the South Carolina mm -hmm. Hospitality Association, that's one of the largest employers in the state, and that it, we first saw that rear its ugly head. Uh, in the early 2000s, when South Carolina, that does not have a minimum wage, passed a law against a city or a county establishing minimum wage. So we have a law against having a minimum wage higher than the federal minimum. What was that date again? I, I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> but that, I do know that Point Wheeler and I wrote legislation to be able to have sick leave as a right, even if you don't have to pay people. So you sick, we, no fault sick leave for employees with so many employees under a certain amount. So they, these were steps that we we gave for an alternative to the bad plan. But that passed, I think it was in 2012. Robert's probably looking it up to embarrass me. But um, <laughs> what what didn't get passed in that bill, because it was a bill to prevent anything, anything, they only passed wages in that one. And so they came back in 2012 and introduced it again. And it was to prevent any benefits being established by a city or county government for an employee, any benefits, child care, sick leave. <clears throat> um, and sick leave is the one that really got me. And, and so the sick leave was, last time I checked, was the law in 139 countries. You can't get fired for being sick. You stay home, take care of your child, you can't get fired. Mm -hmm. In South Carolina, we don't not only don't have a sick leave law, the United States doesn't have a sick leave law, we have a law against sick leave. Mm -hmm. That law came up to bite working people on the ass during COVID. Because that law was used to say that if the CDC, this is in 2020, CDC, people are dying. And the CDC says you're supposed to wear a mask. If you wear a mask and your boss says you can't wear a mask and he fires you, that's too damn bad. Not only can he fire you, you don't get to apply for, uh, for the unemployment that you've earned. And so if you know these things, I don't, I don't know how you would not want to be angered and want to do something about it or you just kind of try and ignore it, which I'm afraid is what happens because most people don't think they have the power to address these problems. So, let me have a, there we go. What, what slide on, Robert? Where you're going from strategy one, follow the money to strategy two, follow the power. That makes sense. <laughs> and so the, um, the following the money thing, um, we haven't gotten to the URL for that yet, have we, Robert? Yeah. Okay. That's the there's the different kind of power is what we want to look at is the political power and who has power, where do you get power? And there's this notion of having voters to get power. Well, that doesn't really work anymore. I mean, for instance, you can look at say just randomly pick Jim Clyburn's district with 68 percent black. The more blacks you pack into a district, or the more people of a similar value system or um values that you pack into a district over that which it would take to win that district or, or they decrease the power of that vote yeah and so if you were in the earlier class we talked about uh three-fifths vote being passed at the philadelphia convention the founding of this country that was pushed by the delegation from south carolina because they had thousands of enslaved people they wanted to count in the census which would then give them more seats in the house so they, they came up with a compromise, the three-fifths compromise to count people of color as three-fifths. And that also drove the Electoral College in terms of giving the small states more power. And so those two things that people are still complaining about um, started here. But today, when we run the numbers on the value, the strength of the Black vote, because of the, the gerrymandering, a Black vote in South Carolina is equivalent to about three-fifths of a white vote. So not much has changed in the last couple hundred years. And so the corporate power is best seen and illustrated by looking at the national convention 
And you look at the, it's like in a, a football game where you've got the banners on the wall or the basketball game or the racetrack game, and you've got all these corporations. Yeah. And a lot of them are the same. And they're supporting both sides. This becomes really clear at home when you look at the donations from the McNair firm and mm -hmm. the Nelson Mullins firm. Yeah. And they are they max out to both parties. <laughs> when you have enough money, you win every time. <laughs> and so now that corporations are people, the corporations have an awesome amount of power that we were warned about that we're going to talk about in just a minute here. And now political power is supposed to come from, from where? Where's political power supposed to come from in the Constitution? Oh, from the people. Oh, from the people. Well, that's too bad we did that didn't happen. <laughs> There's nothing in the Constitution about political parties. And um, there was articulated opposition to the concept of parties. See up here uh, what John Adams had to say, uh, and I'll read it in case you can't see it. Two great parties in opposition to each other would be the greatest political evil under our Constitution. And George Washington warned, yeah, right. the alternative domination of one faction over another, sharpened by the spirit of revenge, natural to any party dissension, leads at length to a more formal and permanent despotism. This sounds like it was written yesterday. <laughs> so South Carolina has two viable parties, viable meaning that they're the only ones that can possibly win. Mm -hmm. so these people start third parties and they think they're in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was actually in Europe the first time the, the Green Party got seats in the Bundestag. If they got 5%, and they run on a ticket yeah. in your district, you vote for the party. And there's a party line, which you vote for. And they hold up. And if the candidate doesn't follow it, they throw the candidate out. And so if you get 5% of the national vote for your party, you get a seat in the Bundestag. And I was in, I was in Bonn, not, we don't, they were in Bonn then, when they got their first a seat mm -hmm. with the Green Party. Mm -hmm. And so there is a radical distinction between places that have operative third parties in this country that doesn't. Mm -hmm. Because these people made up this thing. These people that are running a show with their two parties, they made that up. Yeah. They never let anybody else play. And so 80% of the money that drives our campaigns here in South Carolina comes from corporations. The other, there's so many big boondoggles. I feel like Chicken Little because I can see the train coming. <laughs> And I could scream and yell and wave my arms and nothing happened. Uh, I can't even remember what year it was, but it was the last thing that the federal government needed to be able to restart the nuclear industry. And the last thing they needed was to find a willing state that was stupid enough <laughs> or corrupt enough to be able to pass a law that Ooh. allowed the power company yes. to begin charging you for power for a plant that's not even built. <laughs> and, and I saw it coming. It happened in Florida. They voted it down because they, they, they titled it wrong. And in South Carolina, it was the, I can't even remember the, the tortured title, basic, the, base the Base Load Review Act. Act. The Base Load Review Act. What the hell is that? Well, that's it's, gonna, it's, gonna keep, it's gonna keep Aunt Minnie from paying for this, the, again, the whole bill. It's a good <laughs> thing to spread that out. <laughs> I can point to a $9 billion hole in the ground oh, yeah. that they didn't spread out that we're still paying for. And so when you follow that money, that was a most amazing vote I've ever seen. <laughs> the guy that was in charge of, the, of managing it through the LCI, the Labor, Commerce, and Industry Committee, I'm getting old, I can't remember his name, Jay probably knows. He's a, he was an ALEC um, member, not only an ALEC member, but a task force chair. And he is a right-wing wacko <laughs> that believes that anything that we can do to improve the economy is going to trickle down and make us all happier. And so that bill never had hearings. And I was ready for a hearing, raised hell about there being no hearings. And they told me, we don't have to have hearings. There's nothing that requires us to have hearings. The bill went from the, from the full committee with no subcommittee hearings to the floor of the House and passed. And it was three days from start to finish. It went to the Senate then. This is a Republican bill. It went to the Senate then. The floor champion of that Republican bill was Tommy Moore. Tommy Moore was a Democratic candidate for governor that year. And it passed with no debate. That's what brought us that $9 billion hole. In and when you follow the money on that one, 
They hired the McNair firm. No, that was Nelson Mullins. Do you remember which firm wrote the law? They they hired a firm. They they be in the the legislature mm -hmm. got a firm to take a boilerplate piece of legislation and make it fit here. That same firm, not in the name of the firm, but in the name of the groups or individuals that work for the firm, gave the governor like sixty five thousand and each of each of the committee members and the committees they need to move. And here's these tranches of money coming from industry, and it's all written down. And that's one of the amazing things that. It's not mine here. I mean, it really helps you understand who's driving the train when you find out who's paying the, paying the bill. Yeah. I mean, and it, this is a, a, a profit-driven capitalist system. When corporations pay for 80% of the elections, who owns the election? The people well, pay for it. So it's that simple. And we got to simplify our message yeah. and have the facts to back it up. And so 80% comes from, uh, from uh, big businesses, 16% out of the candidate's pocket, and less than 4% comes from small donations and from individuals. Ah, this, this is where we talk about corporate power. And I think that this is probably where I can bring Comrade Pitts up to talk about the, this amazing story of people being warned in the beginning against corporations. Yeah. And Lewis, I'm gonna leave you the opportunity to, uh, to discuss those early decisions and who, why those founding fathers were concerned about corporations. And so let me see if there's anything I want to say here before I bring on my good friend, Lewis Pitts. And we'll take questions after Lewis talks. So we've got some interactive things here for getting your questions. Brett, did you want to talk about the idea of your votes mattering less in certain states if that state has like a a system of governance where one party governs everything? I think we talked about that earlier today where a party controls the governor's house, the legislature, and your Yeah, I know, I know what you're talking about. And that is in the study guide. It's okay. not in the PowerPoint. But, but some of the things I hope that you read uh, are written down. But with we, one, of the, one of the things that Robert just mentioned is what amounts to kind of like a, 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 health, a health test of what passes for democracy. And one of the really revealing things that people don't really understand, everybody knows that there's a battleground states where it's really important, right? Battleground states where all the money goes, right? Battleground states where all the grants are to defend democracy. But why do they call it a battleground state? And it's the only place you can't predict with some degree of assurance who's going to win. The rest of these elections are a hoax to make us believe that we're you know, doing something democratic to decide who the winners are. And we really have not been affecting that for a long time. There's right now 22 states that are Republican trifectas, mm -hmm. meaning they run the House, the Senate, and the governor's office. Many places, if not most, that body in, in concert appoints the judiciary. Right. And so they're running the show. Now, I remember, I'm old enough, as are some of the people in this room, to remember when the Democrats were the white supremacist party of South Carolina, and there were no Republicans. And so, well, we had what we had, Brown, Brown v. Board or Briggs v. Elliott, what do you want to call it, in 54, and we go up to 64 for the Civil Rights Act, and uh, 65 for the Voting Rights Act, and 1970 in South Carolina was when the first people of color were elected to the legislature. And in, I've known people in 68, Julian Bond in Atlanta, in Georgia, uh, he was elected to represent uh, an Atlanta district. They wouldn't seat him because he was against war in Vietnam. But there were there, there were people banging on the door to integrate the, Democrat, the solid South, the solid Democratic yeah. white supremacist South uh, by, the, by the late 60s, uh, only 100 years after the end of the Civil War. We didn't have progressive legislators elected in South Carolina that, that were really uh, radical when you get down to their uh, objection of the values that were driving the train. It was Gilda Cobb Hunter and Joe Neal in, in 1992. Very shortly thereafter, um, the redistricting from that 90 era kicked in and the Republicans held more parties. And they, the, by the time we got to the 2000 redistricting, the um, Republicans took over completely. So our trifecta goes back to 2002. 
And uh, where I'm living now in Lexington County, where 26 years it wasn't even a Democratic candidate on the ballot. It doesn't matter if there's one now. <laughs> I mean, I, I've been to vote more recently. When I go in and, and I, I look, and there's the page where you sign in the primary as the Democrat, and it's on three. And I say, how many pages were there before this? Because I'm looking over the Republicans and stack of pages. They said, no, that's the first page. But that's the way, that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. We can't tell you, we'll talk about this next class, because then we're talking about what do we do about what it is we now know. Yeah. We can tell you within a, a, a few percentages which seats are changeable and how you can engage that reality to develop power. Is anything else I forgot, Robert? No. I'm sure there's many things I forgot, but we're <laughs> we're ahead of the time here and I'm gonna get this up here. Uh, and, and Lewis? Yes, sir. Let's hear from you. Let's see you. You didn't speak for you. There we go. Yo. <laughs> Bigger than life. So, well, first of all, I'm so delighted to be here once again because I have the utmost respect for this school, which is such a good representative of or representation of the life and work of Jessica Simpkins. And, and her legacy. And I know I have some friends that have already been very kind and overly generous to me. And I, I greatly appreciate that. And I appreciate all of you here tonight. Um, I, I guess, I don't know if you've covered it. I didn't backtrack and look at all the classes this time, um, but the, the booklets that, that Becky has put out, one in particular that features that 1946 National Negro Youth Conference. It was in Columbia. I encourage you, if you haven't seen that, look at that and how progressive and it was at the frontier of fighting imperialism, led, black led, and getting at the colonial power still of the U.S. That's, that's a wonderful radical history with W.E.B. Du Bois speaking and, and so forth. That is something uh, we could all hopefully, you know, be proud of. I, what, I, what, I, what I mainly want to talk about is the concept and how it got to be that a corporation, <laughs> which is which is just made up of something on a piece of paper to make profit, has been granted personhood status. Yes. Now, you know, like, you know, who cares maybe? But think how hard African-American people have had to fight to not be treated less than a person, meaning three-fifths is still a battle. Look at women treated as less than a human being. And what that means is, you don't have the rights of a full person and therefore somebody else, if it's a slave, the master looks out for you. If you're a woman, it's your father or maybe your husband and all that that we know about. If you're a child, and I did a number of years of children's rights work, realizing that that fight to see children as persons with the right to be heard is part of this this value. So when that cherished concept of you're a person with wielding that you can use constitutional rights, when that ends up in the hands of a, of a corporation, which then doesn't die like a real human being, but ends up having life in perpetuity and can have interlocking boards and subsidiary that's part of the monster that we're dealing with. Now, I'm so, I'm not surprised, but I'm thrilled to hear Brett succinctly put, and I can tell that y'all are a coach, we ain't got no democracy, we got a tyranny. And, and what I found in my 43 years of being a lawyer and a bunch of more after that, I'm 75, is we have a tyranny. And when I would usually research and be involved in a case and find, it was worse than I thought. Yeah. And I find that people, that's one of the greatest weaknesses that, that the, the people have to be able to grasp that this thing that we try to celebrate on the 4th of July 
that we're colonized in the, in the believing is as bad and corrupt and is unequal and in fact is so low on the totem pole of other countries with what we've got <laughs> that's good, it, it shocks people. I think that's why Dr. Martin Luther King said at some point, as many of you know, that sometimes the white liberal would be the greatest impediment to the struggle because they just kept saying, wait, it ain't really as bad as you think it is. All right, so let me, let me jump to this question of who rules, because when we were working, as Brett talked about, y'all sketching out the next class, what do we do? How do we, how do we proceed? If, you're, if there's not clarity on who's ruling, meaning is the problem the Democratic Party, or is the problem just the Republican Party? This is a historical moment where a lot of people think that the, the only problem we got is the Republicans have nutted out with, you know, with Trump and all that. And therefore the answer must be the Democratic Party. Let me just say that's certainly not my, my belief. So another aspect of this is if we don't learn these lessons and cut through this, we fall prey to the despots preferred mode of, of, of ruling is controlling our minds, not having to control us physically. As a last resort, they use the police, you know, they use the army, the military, but they'd rather have us so colonized in our thinking that we don't even realize we're oppressed. We think we're the greatest country in the whole world and we got all these freedoms. And we have to cut through that. So I'm gonna be using a lot of resources from a book that I highly recommend. It's not a new book, so I think you can find it cheap, is what that means. I think it came out in 2002. It's not written by or for lawyers, thank goodness. It's called Unequal Protection. Unequal Protection, and it's by Tom Hartman. Funny way to spell Tom. As you can tell from the way I talk, I'm from Bethune, South Carolina. Tom, <laughs> you can get that. You would really, I think, appreciate that. And another source that I highly recommend is, I think Dr. Green mentioned it. And by the way, that Dr. Green, to be as young as he is, has, has become so wise. Isn't it amazing? You've seen it. I've seen it over the courses of, of these things. So congratulations and happy birthday, Dr. Green. It is the website, you can just write P-O-C-L-A-D, Poclad, Poclad. It stands for Program on Corporations, Law and Democracy. And I was one of the co-founders, not the only co-founder of that entity, which really triggered, I think, in this nation, the, the, the underscored the importance of looking at the history and unpacking how the corporation gets status as a person. And it happened in 1886. It did not just happen in 2010 with citizens united so here we go now don't take a deep breath because i'm not going to start with adam and eve in the garden of eden but i do want to go back and see if y'all remember as i did in 1492 columbus sailed the ocean blue all right i'm gonna we'll do we'll do a quick sweep of history because the way we got taught it didn't cover this part <laughs> so columbus supposedly discovered um america well we know now enough that he didn't Discover anything that he stumbled into these people that had a decent civilization. That was 1492. That began a colonizing of the world by the Europeans, of course. And then we jump ahead to 1522. That's Magellan. Remember, sails around the world. So what does that begin? If you will, that's the beginning of globalism because these different countries, we have Spain and we have Portugal, when they start these things and figure out trade routes and they can circle the globe, that begins the expropriation, the exportation, the, the killing people, the chopping off their hands if they won't bring the gold and stealing their resources, enslaving people that we're still dealing with the legacy from. Now, since, we, you know, as we know, our original oppressors, we were colonies, the, our revolutionary wars with England, in 1600, literally the last day of the year 1600, Queen Elizabeth 
and 200 noblemen and members of parliament, meaning the ruling class in England, chartered a corporation called the East India Company because they were trying to get in in the competition with the Dutch, with the French, with, the, with Spain, with Portugal, to get in on all this theft and exploitation. And they were getting in on it late. So that's 1600. Now, thanks to something that happened not that many years ago, we've all begun to get a bit, little sense of 1619. Remember from the New York Times and that controversial study in Jamestown, Virginia, shows up a ship with 20 slaves, and I believe that's supposedly the first slaves that, that, ha that, that are brought to, to this country. And Jamestown was named after King James because Queen Elizabeth died in 1603. So King James, that's the King James version of the Bible that my mom taught me so much about. But then of course we then can jump to 1620, the pilgrims. And we all have put on little hats in school and make out of a, a South Carolina pine cone, make a turkey. <laughs> and the pilgrims came on the Mayflower, right? Did you know that the Mayflower was a ship owned by the East India Company? It had already made three trips, bringing people over here in behalf of a large corporation to try to exploit and see what they could do, how they could make and exploit and basically make money as part of the East India Company. So the East India Company, some of its first land was in charter to be a charter of the Virginia Company named after Queen Elizabeth, who was known as the Virgin Queen. That's where Virginia got its name. Now, the point that I'm maybe belaboring here, even back then, in these dates we're talking about, 1606 and all, they had interlocking boards of directors. So you were they were creating this maze of legalese and obfuscation that did nothing but suck the money from the people and from the earth into the hands and pockets and coffers of royalty, the kings, the queens, and their henchmen, the members of parliament. So the Virginia Company and the East India Company have interlocking boards of directors. And they also have stocks. So you're getting, you're, you're getting in place what's, what's an, what's, isn't a corporate thing, at least I certainly was never taught about that. And in these charters that were charted, here, the king or somebody give it, it would say you had to take all this land in, in, the, in the Virginia colony, remember 13 colonies, Virginia colony, and, and your job, what your mission, your charter grants you is listen, plant, govern, and rule. They were expressed about it then. You go in there. So that's who the colonies, colonies that we, we kind of want to identify with, we're beginning to realize, wow, maybe we need to have a revolution against these folks. So by 1760s, so we're coming up on 1776, 1760s, the East India Company had vast colonies and resources in India and China. Because I and think about Asia, I'm gonna read a quote in a minute, it's gonna have the term Asia in it. That's what they, they were doing. But because East India Company was trying to compete with the Dutch and so forth, they were, they'd become almost bankrupt. So they were having to start figure out ways that they can make more money. So they said, what do corporations do? What do we hear when there's, when there's debt? Somebody's got to tighten the belt, belt tightening. So what does, what does Great Britain or England do? And what does the East India Company do to the colonies? Is they decide, well, wait a minute. Some of these colonists are starting, to, they're becoming to be a, 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 a merchant class of their own. Some of them had their own ships. Some of them were buying tea from the Dutch not from the East India Company. So East India Company has the benefit because it runs or is intertwined with parliament and the king and the queen. 
they start passing laws or requiring licenses and they do the legalese to say that anybody but us, nobody but us gets to sell tea in the United States. Well, it's not you know, in the colonies, in our colonies at this time. Mm-hmm. Because by, by 1681, most members of British Parliament were stockholders in the East India Company. So I want you to think now and a few years ago, Nancy Pelosi, all these rascals own stock. So it's the same thing. I, I guess that's the point I'm making. So one of the things about this belt tightening was a tea tax putting a tax and taking other steps to give tax refunds to East India Company to put out of business the emerging uh, merchant class in the, in the colonies. Does, it, does that ring a bell when we talk about 1773? That's the Boston Tea Party. So I sure never was taught that the Boston, I remember in Boston Tea Party, they climbed on some chips and they threw a bunch of tea over and it was Boston. It was rebellion and it was against, sorry, my telephone is ringing. It was a, August 3rd, I believe. It was, it was, a, it was a basically a people's revolution. They threw about $3 million. Was it three or more million? A million dollars worth of tea in the sea, dressed up like Native Americans now, we were told they were fighting against taxation without representation. A more honest history, if we were taught, would be it was more like a fight of a Walmart in collusion with a, a ruling party that was creating a monopoly and putting out of business the mom and pop stores that were trying to exist there. Now, let me make a quick point here. That 1776 rebellion, it is our great 4th of July, Declaration of Independence, all that stuff, was a, if you will, a rebellion for that merchant class. It wasn't doing anything to help the farmers and the lower class people. Now, maybe you know a little bit of history like Shays Rebellion. You wait about 10 or 12 more years later before they're crafting the US Constitution, when you've had Shays Rebellion, that was the farmers and the poor people going into a courthouse and, refu- and refusing to let the banks enforce their debt and foreclose on the land. That was more of a revolution that was making frightened our, for- our, forepar- our forefathers as they were crafting that constitution. So this book, Unequal Protection, has a great chapter on that, that Boston Tea Party. But let me, if I could, take a moment to share with you 1773, now, and how angry the colonists were about what, how they were being exploited by a corporation. Now, so there was a, a, a fake name, a person named Rusticus. They put out pamphlets. We kind of were taught about pamphleteering and so forth in that time frame. But there was one called the Alarm, and Rusticus, was said this, and bear with me, you know, I got to read a quote. He's there saying, 1773, are we like manner to be given up to the disposal of the East India Company who have now the assurance to step forth in aid of the minister, and they're talking back about parliament, to execute the plan of enslaving America. Their conduct in Asia for some years past has given simple proof how little they regard the laws of nations, the rights, liberties, or lives of men. And listen to what they said they were accused in this corporation of doing. They levied war, excited rebellion, dethroned lawful princes, sacrificed millions for the sake of gain. The revenues of mighty kingdoms have centered in their coffers. And these not being sufficient to glut their avarice, they have by the most unparalleled barbarities, extortions, monopolies, stripped the miserable inhabitants of their property and reduced whole providences to indigence and ruin. 1,500,000, it said, have perished by famine in one year, not because the earth denied its fruits, but because this company and their servants 
engulfed all the necessities of life and set them at so high a rate that the poor could not purchase any. Holy smoke. <laughs> what are we talking about here? <laughs> now, I am so furious that I didn't get taught that in Bethune and I don't think I'd have been taught that in Columbia. And let's just take a quick minute. There's a conscious movement afoot now to not teach us anything about slavery and race or about any of this real history. It, it, it's just, it's just, it's preposterous. Now, okay, the founders, boy, they all, they were all slave owners, some were better than others. You know, we're gonna have we can have some quotes from Jefferson. He's a lot better, a lot better cat than Alexander Hamilton. But let me just say this: all of those founding fathers that got together in Philadelphia and where it was 1780, 89 and all, they believed in an, an elite guardian class. Mm -hmm. Now, Jefferson didn't think it should be the artificial aristocracy, meaning that you got it by blood kin, that you were a, the son of a king, or you know, you were some prince or some, something like that. But they did believe in what he called the natural aristocracy, the wise and the capable. Now, I mentioned earlier, way back at the beginning, us having our minds colonized. It's for the life of me, I don't understand how this Broadway play called Hamilton, it apparently has some very creative, talented, non-white people performing, which I celebrate and all that. But how they took a man who was a banker, Alexander Hamilton, okay. who believed that the, quote, rich and the well-born should rule the country. Mm -hmm. Now, they were forced, and Brett underscored this, some of our founding documents, Declaration of Independence, Constitution, Taft, all political power. Look in your look in the state constitution. Sometimes I'll read the North Carolina Constitution to a to a group and kind of ask them, did this come from Ralph Nader? Did it come from the Black Panther Party? It's the damn constitution. All sovereign power rides with the people, resists with the people, and the government has only the power that the people consent to. So they put that in there just to get the buy-in from that other class of farmers and people that were having Shays rebellion and so forth and so on. All right, maybe I should pick up the pace here a little bit. <laughs> so along this time with that prior history of being so terrorized by the East India Company and seeing what's going on there, those states, when we did have our independence, those states, they were, Jefferson wanted to have a ban in the constitution against monopolies. And I think one of our slides has a quote from Jefferson, who was Thomas Jefferson. Now we're talking about 1800, let's say. They were afraid of the money. Robert, you want to show that one? Let's, uh, not that one. Yes, let's take a look at that quote right there. The end of democracy and defeat of the American Revolution will occur when government falls into the hands of lending institutions and moneyed corporations. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Am, I, am I making sense to anybody? Am I clear? Yeah. So they, now think about this. Today, if you want to incorporate, most of them do it in, in Delaware, pay a little bit of money. I don't know, I don't actually know. I think it's a hundred less than $100. And you can get a, a corporate charter for any lawful purpose. Mm -hmm. And you can have life in perpetuity. Now, back before the Civil War, states had, and that would be, that's issued by some, some functionary in, in the Secretary of State's office. Before this, because of that history, it took, depending on the state, a two thirds vote of a state legislature or sometimes a three quarters vote. So a super majority of the legislature to give you a corporate charter, your corporate charter had to say explicitly what you're doing. It had to be for a public purpose, like building canals, building bridges, doing something useful for society. And it had to have an ending date. It wasn't this life in perpetuity. 
And you sure didn't have the power to amass money and then pour it back in with a political contribution to buy the senators and the house members and the mayors and so forth, so forth and so on. There were no interlocking boards, limited lifespan uh, and, and so forth. Now, the Supreme Court issued a, a, a US Supreme Court a case in 1819. It ain't worth taking the time to go into the detail of that one, but it said that if a charter, if a state hasn't reserved the right to, to, to make rules on a, on a chartered corporation, then it can. So luckily that prompted a lot of turmoil in the states for the Civil War now. So we're talking about 1820s, 30s, 40s, 50s. And you look, state of South Carolina even, state of North Carolina has a constitutional provision. South Carolina Constitution Article 9 says the General Assembly shall proscribe the powers meaning has, still has control of. Mm -hmm. So there's been a mechanism that would allow, if, if we had to, if the people's candidates were actually in state government to go after one of those uh, corporate entities that are polluting in whatever way, coal companies, or whatever, and you could put it to death. So by 1855, the US Supreme Court issued an opinion uh, uh, it was, um, had to do with, with uh, Dodge. Uh, I, don't, I don't see that. Dodge versus Wosley. And it said, a corporation is subject to, uh, to government control and it can even face the death penalty if the government decides to shut it down if it's acting illegally. Meaning you can't keep getting, pay a fine, pay a fine, pay a fine, and, you, and it becomes a cost to doing business. Now, then comes steam and coal and railroads and the industrial revolution. A lot of stuff starting to happen, which is making money for a select few of people. And they are amassing huge wealth and they're getting more and con more control of the, the, the levers and handles of government. And let me read to you, we're at, let's go to 1864. So it's right at the end of the Civil War. And we're going to go to uh, Jefferson. I'm sorry, not Jefferson. Lincoln, Lincoln, Lincoln. Lincoln writes a letter to a friend of his, a Colonel uh, William Elkins. And he says, he, he goes, oh man, we've spilt the blood of our young, wonderful youth, but we had to have this civil war to save the life and the heart of our nation. And it's coming to an end, thank goodness. And he says this, and I quote, but I see in the near future a crisis approaching that unnerves me and causes me to tremble for the safety of my country. As a result of the war, corporations have been enthroned and an era of corruption in high places will follow. And the money power of the country will endeavor to prolong its reign by working upon the prejudices of the people until all wealth is aggregated in a few hands and the Republic is destroyed. I feel at this moment more anxiety than ever before, even in the midst of the war. God grant that my su suspicions may prove groundless. God didn't grant it, <laughs> in, in my opinion. So, that's how clear it's been. I could read on and on and on quotes from towering figures in the establishment that tell us that private entities that amass more wealth than a man, and that's why they sort of, uh, you know, if you, we kind of sum this up. If you, the greater gap in, 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 in economic well-being, meaning the greater gap between the rich and the poor, the less democracy you have. Yeah. And it's pretty well established that our nation maybe has the greatest gaps in the world right now and has, and it's, and it's getting worse. All right, so let me tell this, this story. So Civil War, we know the 14th Amendment, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, the known as Civil War Amendments, 13th, free to slaves, 14th says, 
all people are, are well, the declaration says it's created equal, but no state shall deprive anybody of equal protection. It's supposed to be equal rights for everybody. Now, what are the railroad lawyers? Now, the railroad lawyers have, and the railroad presidents are becoming the Supreme Court justices. Yeah. <laughs> that's not just me talking, that's, that, that's history, that's how it works. So they start going, wow, how about this? Because what's going on then? And I've never th thought about this. Steam locomotive, you, you ride in some of the cases that we're gonna talk about come out of California. You're in San Mateo or Santa Clara County and there's your county, you're in the county and the railroad goes shooting by, throwing those cinders and sparks out, running over your cattle on the, on the thing, setting things on fire, burning down the barns. So the county says, we ain't going to tax you railroads a little more than we tax Farmer Brown. Mm -hmm. and they do that. They put a higher tax because looking out for the health, welfare, and safety of the people, which is supposed to be the purpose of a legislature. Mm -hmm. They do that. Well, guess what? The, the, the railroad lawyers say, hmm, how about that's a violation of our rights. We aren't treated equal. So all we got to do is say we're a person. How do we get to say our person? Well, they started trying that. Well, by 1877, by 1877, four cases had gone to the US Supreme Court where they were saying, well, the 14th Amendment was meant to cover a corporation because it's made up of a bunch of men. And a bunch of men are persons, so they should, the corporation should have, and the Supreme Court basically said BS. The 14th Amendment was intended to protect the freed slaves and not to regulate commerce and be involved in. Mm -hmm. So what do they do? They, they'll do anything. One of them comes up, well, I got, a, I got a journal. I was in on it when they passed the 14th Amendment. 1882, secret journal. And we said in conference that we wanted personhood protection, equal protection for corporations. Turned out that was complete BS, but they were making that argument. Now, I haven't been emphasizing the race question. Everything implicates race, but I do want to emphasize this point. In 1883, they were still trying, even though it had been, been, you know, four times rejected. This is one out of a county called San Mateo. And in the argument there, I believe the railroad lawyer made the first reverse discrimination argument. Now, I've got the quote, but I've gone, whoa, I've gone on way longer than I intended to. I'm not going to read the quote, but the lawyer stood up and said, all right, somebody, quote, it's very clear if we look back over the history of the past 20 years, this is 1883, that this country has done a great deal for members of the Negro race. Now, think about it. Now, it's done a hell of a lot in 1883. <laughs> it's done a hell of a lot. Okay. It's made, them, it's made them free men. It's placed them on par and equal, equality with the white man. But that's none too much. We do not complain of that. We only say that something should now be done for the poor white man. And goes on and on and is making that argument in behalf of the railroads. Mm -hmm. Now, in that case, there was no decision because it settled. And when this case settles out, the parties said, We'll figure this out. If the county must have conceded, the railroad said, we'll pay you damn little tax and, and we'll move on. But they kept coming back with another one. Another one in an adjacent county, Santa Clara versus the same railroad. They brought it up. Now, that went to a decision. That railroad put forward six different types of defenses. All at stake was a little bit of money around how much it was being taxed more than a white person. They made this argument, the constitutional argument that they are a person and they had to be treated equally. But the Supreme Court decision in the text of it, if you read it, says we don't reach the constitutional question. We're going to decide it on some narrow picky thing about whether the county assessor office versus the state assessor office had the right to assess the value of the fences narrow. So you think, great, so there was no discussion about the policy, 
what it would mean, would it hurt people, was it in the interest of people, blah, blah, blah. But at that time, the clerk of court of the Supreme Court of the United States was a prominent activist lawyer who'd been a railroad president. He earned more money than the Supreme Court justices. And he put together at the end a writing up of the case and put what lawyers call uh, Jay will know, a head note, which is basically has no legal horsepower. It's somebody else's summary of the bullet points. It's literally a bullet point. So let me read you the bullet point that this rascal stuck in that has led to these next year, hundred plus years of corporate personhood. It said, quote, the court does not wish to hear argument on the question of whether the provision of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which forbids a state to deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws, applies to these corporations. We are all of the opinion that it does. That's it. Uh, yep. There's no authority. And, and to this day, there's never been a good articulation of any of that. Now, there's one more slide, Robert, if I haven't bored everybody to death. If you oh, could find no. one, it's got that picture where uh, it was 1938 and Supreme Court is a, the one right there, applying equal protection. Of the cases at the Supreme Court, he says this, this was a white guy from Alabama on the Supreme Court who I believe was found to have been a member of the Klan, but he <laughs> did at least say this, of the cases in this court in which the 14th Amendment was applied during the first 50 years, less than half of 1% invoked it in protection of the Negro, and more than 50% asked its benefits be extended to corporations. <laughs> so let me just make this simple point. This whole thing about how the US now is hammering all around the world that we get to go go rule, make, beat the crap out of Russia and beat up China and all that, because we, we're the rule of law. The rule of law is nothing but a big moat filled with alligators designed to protect corporate wealth uh, and so forth. So that whole thing was a legally engineered fraud. Now, just quickly, how does being a person? Well, if you're a person and a corporation is a person, then you, you it are, oh, I have a right to free speech. So let's say a state and behalf of the people say, I'm gonna make you put on your label that you have these contaminants in your food. The corporation will argue, you can't make me speak. I have a first amendment right that I don't wanna say that. And they can argue that and do argue that and often win. There's, there's litigation that occurred in the seventies and then we know about Citizens United was already there, that spending money <clears throat> is a free speech activity, that spending. So we know that the Fourth Amendment protects the privacy of an individual person. It's a personal right. So does a corporation have a right not to have OSHA come in with, a, with a, 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 an investigator and see how unsafe the working conditions are? No, they have to go get a warrant. That's right. yeah. A person cannot be subjected to double jeopardy because that's a constitutional right in the Fifth Amendment. Well, neither can a corporation. Right to a jury trial, corporation. It goes on and on and on. Like Florida, the state of Florida, at some point brought a lawsuit against, or Penny, J.C. Penny brought a, a lawsuit against Florida saying it could not charge them a higher fee for a business license because Florida was trying to protect the small mom and pop businesses. So that's a very awful decision that's happened because what happens, and this is the language that came out of a decision, but written by Justice Rehnquist, uh, you know, a, a right wing of a point D, that the distortive, corrosive effects of huge aggregates of capital accumulated through the corporate form can distort an election if corporations are allowed to spend money. That was a case where the state of Michigan made it a crime 
for a corporation to spend its corporate money on an election. That's what got reversed because they said Michigan can do that because it had corrosive distorting effects. So one, and I'm gonna wind up here. What did the Supreme Court say in 2010, Citizens United, Justice Anthony Kennedy, who was probably supposed to be a moderate at the time. Listen to this, what he said. See, how does this resonate with you? We now conclude that independent expenditures, including those made by corporations, do not give rise to corruption or the appearance of corruption. The appearance of influence or access will not cause the electorate to lose faith in democracy. Well, wasn't that a huge bunk? All right, a couple of summary remarks. This thing is so much worse than that. World Trade Organization, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, these things that President Obama wanted to get in on, Bill Clinton was in on. You know what they are? They are ultranational. They are world-created bodies. Literally, one's called World WT, a World Trade Organization where if Exxon or one of these big corporations feels that a state in your behalf to protect you from some health disaster, some dangerous product, some chemical in the gasoline that's making our kids go blind, whatever it is, wants to ban that, they don't go to Florida court or the fourth circuit or US, they go to somewhere, where, where is it? Is it Switzerland? They go, and who's sitting there? It's in secret. And as corporate lawyers represent the entities that are going against the country. So this sounds like I'm talking science fiction or somehow lost my mind right now, but that's the state of the world with corporations being able to sue or threaten to sue. And it scares any legislator who isn't already bought off who wants to pass a law that might protect you because all their lawyers tell them, well, if we pass that law, we would lose it and we'd have to pay them a bunch of back profits. So let me, and then there's one more quote on there, Robert, that I think you've got, or maybe I've got it. No, the one that, that uh, Jefferson mentioned was the banks. Here's a quote from Henry Ford, Henry Ford. You know, the timing on Henry Ford, I guess early 1900. It is well that the people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system. For if they did, I believe there'd be a revolution before tomorrow morning. So in closing on that point, if you're interested, there's a free daily web uh, email you can get from something called Wall Street on Parade. Wall Street on Parade. And it's written by just a woman and her husband who spent years on there learning, they know that stuff. And it's pretty highly technical because they do that by design to make sure that you can't figure it out. It's nothing but a huge casino. That's the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank that's deciding whether to Woo! whether the economy is heating up, and therefore that means workers are starting to earn enough to, to have stuff, then they need to cool it down. Those are nothing but private banks, folks. Those are private Wall Street banks. It's the biggest scam going on that you can imagine. And they're the ones going to decide whether to raise the interest or not. And they aren't issuing loans to investors who want to build factories that create jobs, that make things that people use. They create these instruments that are called derivatives and junk bonds and it's paper garbage. And that wealthy class is getting so wealthy that it's, it's got me riled up. I apologize that I went on so long. I really do. And maybe this helps a little bit in this larger discussion. Thank you very much. It was great, your brother. Great stuff. Well, thank you so much for that. That was definitely really important to giving some great context to what we've been talking about this semester. And again, the role of of money in politics and the role of power in politics is something that Lewis Pitts really drilled deep in on um, with that that lecture. Um, so, Brett, do you want to think about capitalism or how do you want to handle this? Well, let's take a few questions to address Lewis's presentation. Okay. Uh, I'll wrap up. All right. Okay.
Okay, so first, uh, Rambo, go ahead. You have your hand raised, uh, and then I go to Caesar. Um, I did note in the readings that we have turned a corner, we have gone over a crest of a, a hill, that we are now, according to the readings, community organizers. And that is the only thing that um, Lewis's brilliant talk keeps me in giving, in having hope, so I don't uh, uh, close out of this class and get very stinking drunk because otherwise I'd be depressed. I hear you. Well, if I could, because I've went on so damn long, I usually always close with that because if, if we don't keep hope alive, as Reverend Jesse Jackson has been saying for this all this time, then we are sunk. And, there, and while this is a, a very great class, I did, I've done some traveling, y'all have too, Every community has some folks like y'all sitting in the room probably right now discussing what to do and how to do it and how do we fight back? Because it's, it's the majority of people that are losing in this system. And sadly, because of the, it's, it's the scapegoating thing. Who are you gonna blame? I'm pretty clear who I'm blaming and y'all said it all before I even said a word. It's, a, it's an economic system that only worked for the select few, which was the plan all along, the rich and the well-born, the elite. So we've got the numbers. They just can't turn us white against black, black against white, gay against straight, up against foreigners, all that. That's what's happening you know, over there. But the only thing that, that's worked, and it has worked, is given us a labor movement, the women's movement, you know, the civil rights movement, is the people power. And, and if and you just, if there's one, see, I don't think faith and, you know, hope is not a political analysis. The political analysis is pretty damn awful. Hope is an orientation of your heart and your mind. It's somewhat of a faith. It's got a spiritual, whether you want to call it religious. I use the term spiritual Gatorade. You know, sad if you don't like the sports <laughs> analogy, sorry. But if it's dancing, if it's poetry, if it's reading quotes, I love quotes. If it's, if it's liberation theology, do it. And do it with some friends and you will keep that hope alive because that people power is righteously ours. It's been usurped from us and we can take it back. And they are holding on by a thread. That power structure has to bombard us, talking about colonizing our mind. How many commercials do you watch if you try to watch a damn any bit of a television? You're bombarded with these jingles and they hire the, they spend the most money on people to make you think some of those corporations care about you and they don't. And we can do this thing and I'm glad you injected it. It's community organizing and, that, and, and the people power. Democracy is not a spectator sport. It's not something you have, it's something you do. It's like love is not something you just wait and get loved. You do love with your, your spouse and your friends and whatever. We got to do some democracy. And that's what's happening right now in that room and around the nation now. Okay, so there is a question in the chat from Cecil Cahoon. He asked, can you discuss efforts that have been made to undermine the head notes that establish corporate person? I'm gonna try not to talk to somebody else. I don't, I don't have a <laughs> Yes. Re repeat the question, Rob. Okay, the question was, can you discuss efforts that have been made to undermine the head notes that establish corporate personhood? Hmm. Lewis, ask your question, because I don't think anybody else knows about that head note that was uh, in the, um, the ruling on Santa Clara. Well, I think the, the SO somehow was, was uh, you know, it, to the extent you try to make an argument, it's somehow that the wealthy are smarter, that, the, that they got there because they work harder or they're better. Or they, so the way you defeat that is show that's bullshit. <laughs> Look at some of these people. Look at the ones they go to, they go to jail, they're doing drugs, they do, Epstein, all, they're not better human beings. Yeah. There you go. So I, I, I think mo whether it's your, or that somehow God granted 
there's been a lot of ways to justify the unjustifiable. But we go back to uh, how clear it is, even in our founding documents, because it resonates. It's not, it's not a, a parliamentary rule. It's not royalty. It's a democracy. It's a self-governing citizen democracy and education to teach that. Well, I guess the, the sharpest answer I could give, we've got to have an educational system that recognize that citizenship, that you teach the three C's. I grew up talking about the, what you call the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. But if we don't learn critical, creative, and courageous thinking, then we, we, we're sheep. We aren't citizens in a self-governing democracy. And they've, they've done everything they can to disempower us, give us one time a year, or maybe every four years, vote for Tweedledee or Tweedledum, either one of them are always in the pocket of the corporation. And then they tell us, don't vote for a third party candidate, so you vote for the lesser of the evil. You know, somebody else pick it up from here. Go ahead. Um, Lewis, thank you again for, for coming and being with us this year. The question that I was asking was rooted in an assumption I'm making. This head note was published in 1883, 86? 86. 86. 86 by this attorney. And that's a long time ago. That's a hundred and almost 40 years ago, 135 years ago. I have to assume that at some point over the past 135 years, some courageous, critical, and creative attorneys have attempted to undermine that head note and overturn the concept in court of corporate personhood. Did that happen to your knowledge? And who came closest? Are there any are there any examples that point to a winning strategy? Well, very good, very good, very good question. People have, have figured that out. It hasn't been that long ago, you know, that that happened. I think that the program on corporations, law and democracy, even though that was not a legal driven entity, began that, that discussion. There's a lot of law review articles and books you can find about that. But here's what's going on in there. You can think, you bring those, you may make a little headway at some level, but then you run into the higher courts and there's something nowadays called rule 11 or a version of sanctions. So given that this system, and we said from the moment we started and y'all said weeks ago, is rigged, you can't get through the rig. And what they will do, and the purpose of what's called Rule 11 sanctions with civil rights lawyers is they shoot the messenger. Mm -hmm. So you say, lawyer, you brought a, a legal claim and signed a paper that's not well grounded in the law or the facts or is filed in bad faith. So we're finding you, not so much your client. So the lawyers are afraid to do it. So I've listened, I, I think I was listening on when you could do it to Citizens United, who was gonna make the argument? They're afraid to do it. You don't, get, you don't get to be a lawyer that argues in the US Supreme Court if you're willing to be that radical, it seems like. <laughs> I, that's not a, a, maybe the answer that's, that, that's, that's, that I'd like to give, but you don't get that far, just like you won't, well, that's a different different issue. If you get crosswise with the U.S. foreign policy, you're going to get so discredited that, it, that, that it's, it's, it's unbelievable. But that should be happening as, as this, this program on corporation law and democracy has on its, on its website. You'll see up at the top right something called By What Authority, BWA. The, the Latin is Quo Warento. It's a legal proceeding where you say, by what authority are you exercising that privilege or that right? And it's designed to challenge these, this, corporate, this corporate stuff. Who can, you and me, I can't afford to do that. Now the railroads can hire lawyers for Brazil and these rats will charge $1,000 or more an hour. And you get a people's lawyer in there trying to get by on cornbread and beans and Wheaties <laughs> and you're broke. They just break you right off. That's how bad I think it is. Lewis, we've got time for you to give a personal experience about what happened to Christic Institute in the case that you were pursuing and making headway on 
and what happened and then what happened to the Institute? Well, in 1980, a handful of us, well, two Harvard lawyers, which, you know, I wasn't, but I was South Carolina, three okay. lawyers, uh, one priest, I'm not Catholic, a Catholic priest, a Catholic nun, and some paralegals put a little group together called Christic Institute in 1980. It was sort of to be the other side of the moral majority. We wanted to show how government policies and actions were inconsistent with Judeo-Christian ethics. If I was framing it today, I'd be broader than that. I'd have in Eastern religion and, and everything and not leave out Muslim, and, but that's where I was at. And so we were making $400 a, a month, all of us, the lawyers, the paralegals, and all that. And we got involved in a case that later became, amongst some other things, there was like 10 of us, and we, we were growing. It involved our Iran Contra. Now, I, it's too long to go into, but that was when, when Reagan was illegally operating out of the White House basement with Oliver, Oliver North, the undermining of a different economic system in Nicaragua with the Sandinistas, and they were deemed the bad guys, and they were commies, and they were going to be coming up through Florida and eat our babies. So they were shipping guns to the other side. Since Congress wouldn't fund it, how did they fund it? Well, they were smuggling drugs. And we had evidence of that in a case. And we filed a federal racketeering influence corrupt organizations act lawsuit in Miami, Florida and filed it in 80, I believe it was 86, 87. It was about to go to trial when daddy Bush who'd been vice president, daddy Bush had been uh, director of the CIA which many people don't know in 1976. He was vice president, he was going to come in and win. He knew all about that stuff. It was illegal and all that. And we had a lawsuit and we had some of the, we had 40 of the, I guess, well off trial lawyers in the country that were volunteering to help us. We spent $3 million doing discovery, interviewing pilots that were flying the drugs that had all of this stuff. A few days before the trial, the judge in Miami had been appointed by, I'm pretty sure it was Reagan, imposed a Rule 11 sanction against us. He said, we made it all up. It's not valid. You don't get to have a trial. You got, and I'm going to impose a $1.2 million sanction on you. Oh, the Christian Institute by this time had gone from eight or 10 people in 1980 and a rundown in falling apart drug that part of DC, having a little decent office. We had a fundraising office in, in California. We had, we had Hollywood people helping us raise money. We'd gotten up to about 40 people. We were doing work in Greensboro, trying to do storefront lawyer. This is when the nation was celebrating the Berlin Wall is coming down to freedom. And in the United States in the same years, federal judges, <laughs> were shooting the messengers and put yeah. them out of business. And we appealed it all the way up. We had friend of the court briefs on our side from church groups and lawyer groups and all the good people. We lost, they shut us down, crushed it, yeah. crushed it. <laughs> and people wonder why I'm a little bit bitter, bitter and rowdy, but well, that's, that's some of that story. Yeah. Now, I, I want to be careful. That's all bad, but boy, I don't want you to run and hide in the closet and shut the door and never talk about the church again. All this is an argument for why if the people stand together and don't the next time you hear somebody being trashed because they're double checking. Is that really true? <laughs> and I know I'm going far afield. I literally believe well, that the United States was involved, just like Cy Hurst says, in blowing up those pipelines from Russia to Germany to make it look like somebody else. And nobody will believe that and nobody will accept that. They're here. <laughs> I believe you. And, 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 and the, the, it, it's, it's laughable to not, and, and no, I believe. The, the New York Times, we'd like to think, well, I'm not just going to read my Columbia State newspaper. That's Republic. I'm going to read the New York Times. Well, you might as well be reading, I don't know what, but. That's just a fancy version, fancier version of the, the dominant story, the, the, yes. the dominant narrative that is want to be told. It keeps us down here fighting amongst each other 
And believe me, I don't want Donald Trump. And January 6th was, was the worst thing going. But there's, there's some BS that's coming from Biden. And it happened under, there was, there was uh, a renditioning and torture and drone killing under Obama. And I'm sad, you know, it's, it's really that bad. And we were a dying empire. And we're picking a war, a thermonuclear war with Russia and China at the same time. And Bill, it is tragic. So let me stop, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lewis. We are going to move on and hopefully leave on a cheery note, but don't leave us. Don't leave us. I won't. I won't. Thank you, everybody. Don't have to tell him he doesn't have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. He didn't You're tell him. <laughs> So what I wanted to do is pick up, and Lewis, I want you to help me, I'm certainly willing to fill in here. Um, we need to unpack the different ways that they talk about the system that we have. And when you talk about the system you have, you have to have comparative analysis of other systems we could have. And I, I've even heard Elizabeth Warren, when she was like fighting to run for president of the United States, defensively say, well, I'm a capitalist. Mm -hmm. That's not a political party. Mm -hmm. That's an economic system. Wait a minute. You mean Rich. your party is capital? Wait, mm -hmm. wait, wait. What's the opposite of, of capital? That would be would that be social? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Socialism is actually a governance. It's a way you run things. So capitalism is the way you run things, but it's not a party. And so they're <laughs> comparing kind of apples and oranges, not addressing the reality of capitalism, put the capitalism. You know, that um the there's in the reading, there's some really good stuff that takes apart um, capitalism written by the Cato Institute, which is a libertarian group mm -hmm. that talks about the way that capitalism is a self-fulfilling prophecy of keeping some people poor so some people can get rich. Mm -hmm. And so that there's not very many uh, people that really defend it other than those that are benefiting from it directly. And I mean, you, you need to go back and, and consider that what uh, Jefferson said um, when he changed the the word property that was in the Constitution, where we hold all these truths to be self-evident that men and women are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and property. Was the first draft of that, <laughs> and we have fewer people that own their homes in America now than in generations. Wow. And so obviously that gap um, that Lewis referred to is getting wider. We have fewer people with careers. Mm -hmm. And all this fits together when you start lining up the dots that one of the things we studied in the 70s was called the deindustrialization of America. Mm -hmm. And it was the rise of corporations owning things that had been owned by families. And somehow the families, even though they were robber bears, they had more of a relationship with the workers. Like Ford said, I want to pay my workers enough to buy my car. Mm -hmm. But as those, those families became so corporations great. with millions of owners that hired young, you know, Wharton graduates from, you know, in economics and lawyers and whatnot, no one really felt responsible for the damage yeah. they would do when they decided to close America's steel mills because a week it's done in Japan cheaper. And you'd fast forward not very many years at all and this globalization thing, which was chasing cheap labor, yeah. has yeah. deindustrialized America. Yeah. There are very few careers now in America. And so that's, I think that capitalism is a, is a self consuming um, reality where there is, it's like there's no end to the growth or the development, and how much can you pave and cut down? Mm -hmm. I just flashed on one of my fine moments when Jim Edwards, who was the governor of South Carolina became the uh, director of the, the um, energy, U.S. Energy Department. So he was in charge of nuclear reactors and weapons and everything. But he was also a big friend of um, uh, Watts, who was the interior director, who at the time, this was under Reagan. And we had occasion to go when Watts was uh, in, at, at uh, Everett's house in Charleston. And we decided to do it early in the morning. So like at 7 o'clock, I knocked on Jim Edwards' door. And the Secret Service man got him and brought him to the door. <laughs> and there was the TV crew. And we had a banner that was the size of a queen-size sheet that said, after you've cut the last tree, 
after you've caused the last river, after you've killed the last fish, can you eat your money? <laughs> and that, that just that really simplifies it. It's like, do these people live on another planet? Yeah. But I I don't need to go on about capitalism. I think we're all aware of that. The fact is, it's not a political system, and the free market is something that they talk about with with great uh, enjoyment. And uh, this the free the free market means it's free for them. Yeah. And um, that I don't need to do more than say what's on the screen there. What are the downsides of a supposedly unregulated market? And is a, is a free market conducive to social democracy? Uh, does anybody want to like argue or that a free market can be conducive to social democracy? No. I don't like everybody defending capitalism. Excellent class. <laughs> <laughs> You're all going to get extra breaks for this. But this, but let's look at this mixed economy now. We 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 see these countries. They they let's look at. Iceland, Sweden, France, United Kingdom as being social democracies or social democrats. We've had, there was a history we've studied of these times when socialism was like literally something that was happening around the country and there were mayors and whatnot that had social values that outweighed the capital values. And so the mixed economy is something that we hear even liberal democrats attacking socialism. Well, this is like, well, what are the what's the fire department? Is that socialist? I mean, it's like it used to be you had to pay if you didn't have the little medallion on your home to pay the fire department. And they came, they would watch your house burn because you didn't pay. And so now we have socialism as the education. They're trying, they're trying to privatize everything now. Yes. And so it's not so much that that they don't recognize socialism, it's that they want to replace it with a profit system. One of, the, one of the greatest travesties going on right now is the post office. Oh, yeah. yeah. The, it used to be a place for in small towns, which this kind of, America was a whole bunch of small towns before they had big towns. Yeah. It was the heart of the town. Yeah. People could see each other. The post office operated a bank, a nonprofit bank. Uh -huh. And you could cash checks and get money there. And so the, the one of the things that I've watched happen just during my career here of doing mass mailings and running a print shop is finding out that people that were U.S. postmasters now, or at that point, would own a Kinko's or a UPS, that type of thing, where they were seeing the opportunities to develop an alternative to the post office. And right now, they're, they're, they still haven't fixed it, but the post office back, I can't remember who, who was responsible for it, maybe either Lewis or Dr. Green knows, there's no, there's no economist that talks about you having a benefits fund that goes beyond like 30 years mm -hmm. and, and, and federal employees pay into a benefits fund. So when they retire, there'll be money there. They passed a bill for the postal office to have 75 years in their fund. That's what's driving the post office into the bank is the billions and billions of dollars that they're having to take and put into a fund that they can't use to pay their employees or to run the business. And so there's these mechanisms that are happening all over in education. Um, you see the privatization move in education, which is almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you strangle the government by saying taxes are bad, the, the government services get worse. And then people say, look, they, look the government's bad. And so that's another manipulative way of driving us to the bottom. I, one, of my one of my favorite quotes was was when I pointed out something about Nikki Haley. And I I was Grow, the original Grow was across the street from the Olympia Mill. The Olympia Mill was owned by somebody like in somebody up north. And when it came down here from up north, there was this flood of textile industries because of labor laws and environmental laws. Flood of industry, mostly polluting industries by the 70s and 80s. Uh, atomic waste and, and toxic waste were the two largest lobbying forces in South Carolina in the 70s and early 80s. But that we watched those mills leave and go to Haiti or Nicaragua. The one in Olympia went to Nicaragua. And so uh, Nikki Haley being against unions and being against 
basically to get civilization, <laughs> I was able to say that Nikki Haley said, we do not have to compete with third world countries. We can be one. And so we have things that, right. we have things that third world countries, it's a disparaging term, we're not supposed to say it anymore, developing nations, mm -hmm. a lot of them have health care. Yes. A lot of them have sick leave. A lot of them have more social values than this country. Yeah. Cuba. And so this, this is one of the things that I really hope that you can talk to your friends about is that this question she of socialism explore. versus capitalism she is an explore. artificial yeah. argument made by the people that are laughing all the way to the dark side of the moon or wherever they live that they're going to be able to breathe air when they pollute the planet. <laughs> so democratic socialism, the main difference between capitalism and social system is the government's role in caring for people's economic well-being. Yeah. So, so the people that are driving the train now, which is both the Democrats and Republicans, are, they, they describe themselves as capitalists. So their primary role of government is protecting the economic well-being mm -hmm. as opposed to protecting the social well-being by making the economic system function. Okay. So if we're going to protect the economic well-being, we want to keep wages suppressed. We want to smash unions. Mm -hmm. We want to block environmental laws. Mm -hmm. So can you have an economic and social democracy without political democracy? Marjorie's shaking her head. I'll take that as a no. <laughs> Thank you, Glass. <laughs> these, these other questions are tossed away. You can read them. Free market mm -hmm. capitalist system be truly democratic. Does anybody have an example of structural inequality in South Carolina? <laughs> you can walk out the door and look either way. I was getting ready to say. Yeah, you don't have to go far. Mm -hmm. We've got about 4,000 people in, in, in Columbia now that not only don't have a home, they don't have a Medicare card, a Medicaid card, mm -hmm. because South Carolina now is still one of the, I think there's 12 left. And if you look at the states that refuse the Medicaid money, this, this Medicaid money, Mm -hmm. is our federal tax coming back to South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Refusing that money didn't save it because that money then went to Some one of the way. states that expanded <laughs> Medicaid. So when Nikki Haley didn't just say no to Medicaid expansion, she said never, Hell no. literally. Yeah. That was her quote. When she turned down the money, our money, to take, to take the Medicaid cards, there was so little understanding of the complexity of the Affordable Care Act because it wasn't health care. It was insurance subsidy. It wasn't a health care act. It was an insurance subsidy plan. And so the plan was at least smart enough to know that people below the poverty level didn't have money to get into the insurance pool. Right. The Affordable Care Act was an insurance program. And if the, if the year they started it, you made less than $15,600. $15, you were not eligible to get the subsidized insurance because we're giving you a free Medicaid card, yeah. except in South Carolina and at that point, the other states of the Confederacy. If you look at the map, I think I've sent it out before. Yeah. A lot of these things you talk about, if you do kind of an overlay, yeah. they'll say, oh my God, so what has changed here in the last <laughs> 150 years? But that when, when we denied the Medicaid card, it left the poor folks going back to the emergency room. Yes. That was one of the reasons to give them the Medicaid card. Oh, the hospitals lost, it's still losing, the what was called the disproportionate share fund. Mm -hmm. Blake throws something at me if I get off track here. It, it, helps, <laughs> it works for the, the system. But that disproportionate share fund is what we used to call the indigency care. Mm -hmm. So when the poor people went into the emergency room, I sent her a Richmond Memorial, wrote yeah. down, you know, this, we spent this much money, and they would get some money back from the feds from our taxes. Yeah. They don't. They lost, I know that Lexington, the one I remember, lost $380 million the year that Nikki said, we didn't want the government getting between us and our doctor, um, <laughs> denying all kind of stuff, yeah. including um, mental health care and hospital care for the majority of the people that don't have a home that have problems that have precipitated them not having a home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so, Lewis was afraid, Lewis was glad I said it, 
And I'll say it again, democracy is dead in South Carolina. And we need to own that. It's really painful, hard, and dangerous to tell people that their vote doesn't count because we don't want to dissuade them from voting. The purpose of the Majeska School is to tell the truth and empower people to be able to deal with it in a constructive fashion. Yeah. We lie to people if we tell them they can vote their way out of these problems. We can't. Yeah. We can't fix the problems with the tools that are used to keep it in place. Yeah. And right now, we have, we, the South Carolina Progressive Network, has, over the years that we've been doing this, we, I, I've been at the same desk for about 53 years now, spent 20 years with Majeska, who spent 60 years in the trenches, who worked with her mother and W.E.B. Du Bois, um, Du Bois in 1905, the, the Niagara Movement, was that anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist -colonial, group that wanted to see jobs, justice, and health care. The Southern Negro Youth, Co Youth Congress had the same agenda that we do. Mm -hmm. The leadership training schools that Majeska started 70 plus years ago had the same goals that we're looking for. And so the sense of like being despaired about where we are, it doesn't do a whole lot of good to be able to keep that alive. Yeah. And the more you know about the work that came before us, the less distressed you're going to be because I believe, and I'm not, I'm, this is another thing that is, I think maybe rationalization and justification, but I have always felt that South Carolina being like a spring that's held down has a greater potential yes. for radical change than a place like Boston or even California, where the liberals keep saying, oh, well, like St. Louis said, you know, give me a little more time, a little more time. And that if you analogize that to what happened with the demise of the Southern Negro Youth Congress, which was a militant, radical organization that didn't want to like give people fish, they wanted to teach them to fish, they wanted to empower people. And that that militant group was completely destroyed by 1948. At that time, when we're moving towards the just desegregated the military, moving towards having to grant some citizenship rights to people of color, mm -hmm. or there was going to be another civil war. And that what they did was they passed the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, and the people they opened the door to were people that would then justify and support the system because they then became part of it. Yeah. And there are those that consider that to be a bit of a compromise on the nation's part and on our part. It's hard to bring that up today, that mm -hmm. the Civil Rights Movement was a compromise. But if you go back to the dichotomy between Du Bois and Booker T. Washington, yeah. Booker T. said, no, all we want to do is vote. Yeah. All we want to do is vote. Okie dokie, y'all can vote now. <laughs> Happy? No. And so I think that that's something we have to figure out new language and, and constructive ways to raise that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the Majesca School and our work and the electoral arena is trying to do. When we talk about strategic voting, smart voting, understanding the system, being an effective citizen. That's all we can expect of you that graduate from this school is to be an effective citizen, to know your rights as a citizen and figure out how the hell to do them. Yeah. <laughs> and so this next slide, Dr. Green, shows us our choices in democracy. <laughs> One of my favorite slides. <laughs> and I swear, I, it will, I will never forget singing the song, I'm so lucky to be an American, and I am grateful each day of my life. I can vote for my choice, speak my mind, raise my voice. Yes, I like it here. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. I'll take the Phillips head screen. But this is the way we get out of it. We organize, we educate, we agitate, yes. we legislate, we litigate, we organize and do it again. We start again. People don't. And that I'm, I'm, I've been clinging to the notion that if we bank the coals and keep them alive, someday we'll get some more fodder. Yes. Thank you, Donald Trump. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Donald Trump. What he has done mm. is to drop the pretext. Yeah. Yeah. They used to make up stuff about how much they cared about us. 
and how they weren't racist and how they were oremongers. Well, ha, 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 ha. He's ripped the cover off and these other Republicans, they're going, well, yeah, I, yeah, I guess that's me. I guess that's me. Because they're more interested in winning the primary than they are in social justice. And so I think this is a, at least an interesting day, but I think it's a good time to be an organizer. And so I want to, I, I want to uh, close with that and take more questions. We're, uh, we've got another 12 minutes before we eat Dr. Green's cake and we'll keep the uh, screen on so y'all can see us enjoying the cake and wish you were here. And we expect you <laughs> to be here. We expect everyone to be here. Don't forget fruit. Everyone to be here for the graduation on July 1. So we can actually put faces and virtual reality, um, our real life. What's that? R L. There's this real know. life thing that people that go the virtual route make fun of the real life thing. <laughs> but I really would like to see some of you people. But um, are there any questions about where we are now that's going to set us up to talk about those strategic application of this analysis and the strategy? How does that play out in your community? Now that's yeah. next class. Uh, yeah. Dr. No, so there are already a, a few questions in the chat, and also I see Randall's hand is raised too. Um, so try to get through these as quickly as possible. So uh Hannah Bauer asked in the chat, and it's actually really interesting. She asked, What do you think about corporations' use of influence? This is about social media. I think social media and influence for culture is Generation Z's weak point in class consciousness. Um but Say that again. What do you think about corporations' use of influencers? I think social media and influencer culture is Generation Z's weak point in class consciousness. And she yeah. follows up by asking, I guess what I'm really asking is, do you feel like social media has furthered corporations' personhood? Well, I, I will also add to uh, Hannah's question about uh, social media and the like. Um, one of the things that's been going on in, in recent weeks is you're now seeing social media as a battleground in the broader cultural wars. Um, this month being June is also Pride Month, and you're seeing a lot of corporations, you know, putting up their pride flags and the like, but now the far right is attacking them for doing that. You're seeing some corporations pull back from sponsorship programs. Next Monday is Juneteenth. And so this weekend we'll be privileged to see all the corporations like black people two days. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think, again, what we're seeing, and Becky's talked about this a lot, too, is that everything now is a political battleground in some form or fashion. But I think what we have to do as committed citizens and organizers and activists is to find ways to best sharpen tools and to also avoid the pitfall of fighting, you know, each other. Fighting each other, but also being in situations that may not be as important as larger grassroots struggles on the ground. I mean, there's there's so much we could talk about with this issue of social media. I see with my students I clap all the time. I think that one of the things that's happening that somewhat addresses Hannah's question is the way that, and you'll go go pay attention tonight, and you'll notice that the fights are over things that aren't that significant. It's like the, they're, they're picking fights, they being the forces of who want to pick a fight in South Carolina. We've got people attacking um, attacking critical race theory, atta attacking one of the biggest issues now is, is tra uh, transgender rights. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing that's like the driving issue. Well, it's like, excuse me, why is that the driving issue? Mm -hmm. With all the problems we have. Mm -hmm. And uh, that fuels that social media cycle and so everything, everybody is so attuned to that current pain, that current reality, that current discussion, that there's no thoughtful consideration of what brought it on. I don't know if it's not a thoughtful consideration. It's just that you have to think about so many things and how one thing affects the other. When I mean, you have these giant corporations, they have a think that tank. People in the street don't have think tanks. Yeah. But they and when they get with this social media, they 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 can bomb the airwaves with the social media and with this AI is just off the charts. Mm -hmm. You don't even know when you're hearing the truth. Yeah? Right. I, I wanted to no, Lewis. 
Well, uh, on the issue of, of social media, we're talking about giant corporations that are becoming the wealthiest. And what's being revealed right now, and Matt Taibbi is leading the pack in some of this, and it's quite controversial, is how much those social media corporations are being willingly used by the intelligence, I don't mean intel, I mean the, the, the US, FBI, CIA, Pentagon forces. They send, it's, it's documented. The FBI will send Twitter, 150 people that they say, mark them or di diss them as disinformation. And so what's happening is some people are changing the phrase that Eisenhower used of military industrial complex to be censorship industrial complex. So I could probably put up a site or put up, and I don't do that either. I, I deliberately, I never did, I've never been in Facebook and whatever, but I might put out my view about US foreign policy. It might start coming to you as notice this person or this site is known to be a disinformation spreader. Now, what we on the left consider disinformation is all those people that told us don't wear a mask on that side. The same thing's being done here, being done against us. And that means somebody, and it's the corporate entities that are doing that, and they have to be and, and comply with what the government is asking them. Otherwise, they risk being regulated and they don't want to do that. So I'm very frightened. And somebody mentioned artificial intelligence. You throw that in the mix, we've got quite a challenge. Yeah. But there is no alternative. You, we may need to take breaks to build up our, recharge our, our batteries, but we have to keep resisting and walk. My good friend, Reverend Nelson Johnson in Greensboro, we have to keep walking towards each other, towards yeah. each other, and then we can walk together. And I agree with Becky, movement cannibalism, where we're just eating each other, it's like a circular firing squad, that's not helpful. We have to have a larger, um, a, a more generous understanding of what our political line is, and not the perfection, but at least have some deep thought on how to, how to continue the fight together. Thank you, Lewis. My last, my last comment, I'm turning over to Dr. Green to close, is an apology if it was misunderstood to Elizabeth Warren, who I think is a great lady, it was speaking to how she was called on the carpet and had to identify herself as a capitalist. And so it was the dynamic that made that kind of that, that false separation between somebody that cares about social issues and somebody that cares about money. Um, so that I want to do that. And so Dr. Green, take sure. it home. So I know that, um, of course, you've had a, a lively and spirited discussion this, uh, this evening. Again, another round of applause for uh, Lewis Pitts. Really putting everything in the context that we discussed this semester. So next week, again, I mentioned next Monday, of course, is Juneteenth. Um, next Monday at 6.30, we'll have a class talking about the history of GROW and the Progressive Network. Really getting a sense of what so much of what we've talked about looked like and looks like today on the ground in South Carolina since the 1970s. Again, this is where we really hit the rubber and rubber hits the road in terms of the history and the here and now really coming together. And as you'll see, and as you'll see, if you look around this room, there is a rich history of recent activism in this state that Becky and Brett will really bring to light next Monday night. So that'll be a great way for us to think about the legacy of Juneteenth and just as importantly to think about the legacy of small D democracy in South Carolina and throughout this country. People that don't give us their t-shirt size do not get the proprietary Majestica School t-shirt that only graduates can wear. Someday it may be valuable. So <laughs> if you don't have your size, you ain't getting a shirt. So this is the one time where capitalism is actually good. Yeah. <laughs> Again, we'll be back next Monday at 6 30. Uh, until no no Sunday session, right? Sir? No Sunday deep dive this weekend. No. no. Okay. Okay. So I'll see you once again uh, next Monday at we'll six thirty, and now we'll show cut some birthday. So until then, have a good rest of your week.